All right, so what we'll be talking about today is value theory. And this goes back to what the very fundamental question about our own lives of what makes a good life good. Now, this is something that the uh, ancient Greeks philosophers were very concerned about. Uh, and I find this actually very relevant to our everyday sort of lives today. It's, it's not out of date at all in the sense of have you asked yourself what makes uh, your life good? We make these assumptions, we kind of think about it for maybe a couple of minutes, but then we kind of move on and forget about it. So this is really a, a deep analysis of what makes your own personal life a good life. How do you know you're go doing good things? And then that ultimately leads us to what we talked about in meta ethics as well. Well, how do I know what is the right thing to do versus the wrong thing? So if we go to the map real quick, you can see that it's all connected in this semester when we're talking about uh, ethics and the theories that are related to ethics. So we spent a lot of time uh, the past couple of weeks on meta ethics and talking about, well, how do we even establish whether something is right or something is wrong in the first place? How do we even know right or wrong exist. The next step is value theory. Well, if there are these values of right and wrong, good and bad, then what are they? How do we know it's on the right side or the wrong side, the good side or the bad side? And this is where we're gonna talk about two theories in particular, hedonism and desire theory. And they're very different type of theories. So don't get them mixed up because they might sound similar in some aspects, but they're not the same type of theory at all. So when we talk about a value, think about it for a second. When we talk about a value, we talk about it in a very particular way in philosophy. So there are two general kinds of values that we talk about in philosophy instrumental values and intrinsic values or i think the book also calls them intrin instrumental goods you think it's good because it provides you something now that is what we're talking about with instrumental values. i think it's very something that we're very familiar with or it, it's it's really common so look at the how look at the word and in, said instrument it's a tool, it's something that we use, right? So for example, we're using uh, the video conference software, right? It's a tool, it has instrumental value. It's useful in providing online instruction. Now, let's imagine for some reason that it's not doing that, right? It's not working, it freezes up, it pauses or something. It's lost its instrumental value. It's not doing what we're trying to use it for, right? It's not really working. So something with instrumental value can have value, but it can, it can lose its value. Uh, I have a, a thermos here that holds water. I can keep it with me because it has instrumental value because it holds what if it's for some reason it breaks it drops it it leaks it's lost its value again so it's a tool to quench my thirst but it's only good in that it's serving that purpose now intrinsic values on the other hand are really different and this this is why i think takes people for a loop uh, when we talk about ethics and philosophy intrinsic values are the type of values that are good in of themselves. That's how we would say it in philosophy. What does that mean? Well, intrinsic values are, are the type of thing that's valuable even if you don't personally think it's valuable. And that's really different from what we're used to. We're used to think, if I care about this video conference, if I care about this 
thermos, then it's valuable. If I don't care about it, well then it's not valuable. But intrinsic values are type of objective values. They're values that don't rely on anybody to give them value. They're on their own thing. They are valuable by themselves. And so what would constitute an intrinsic value? This is where we get to hedonism. So hedonism is our first theory, and it goes back to the ancient Greeks. When we talk about hedonism, we're talking about your life is good in that you're reaching the intrinsic value of happiness, pleasure. And your life is not going so well, the more pain, suffering that you're experiencing, unhappiness. Now, this is really crucial for the Greeks and uh, Epicurus, who was the first, I guess, noted or famous hedonist. They're going to argue that your life is going to get better, and it's obvious to anybody, if you're achieving higher levels of happiness, more happiness in your life, versus the alternative, right? Unhappiness. But not all happiness is made the same. And this is maybe where we're getting to the connection coming back to instrumental and intrinsic values. Now, physical happiness or physical pleasure, right? Something that causes physical pleasure. Uh, sex, food, right? Uh, these physical pleasures they're very transitory. They don't last very long. And that's kind of the issue here, right? Is that they feel good, we get a rush, you know, uh, neuroscience will tell us that we get pressures of dopamine, we feel this joy when we eat our favorite food, right? Uh, when we have sex, things like that, we get this feeling, but doesn't last. And this is what the hedonists were trying to argue. And maybe this is where they said they were being misunderstood. That to live a good life was not to live a life of physical pleasure. Physical pleasure is okay, but what they were really searching for is attitudinal pleasure. Deeper levels of appreciation and enjoyment. So, my simple example here, I think that might work for everybody, is the difference between sex and love, where you notice love is providing a deeper enjoyment, a deeper pleasure than just sex. It's not just the physical. It's, it has to be something more meaningful in that sense. Now, the hedonists are making a strong case that what the purpose of life is, how to live a good life, to look back on your deathbed and say, like, if you're on your deathbed, you get old, and you look back and you say, you know, did I live a good life or not? How do I know? The hedonist wants to say, well, if you achieve the life of happiness, then you did. Now, happiness is more than just an emotion for the hedonist. I want to get that straight. Because we tend to just talk about happiness as, as an emotion, as a psychological thing. But what the, the Greeks talked about happiness, they talked about it as a virtue, as something that you strive for. It's a goal in life. It's something bigger than you. So happiness on its own, not your particular emotional state, but something to strive for and live for. Now, when the, ha when the hedonist is arguing that happiness is necessary and sufficient for having a good life, that is when, as philosophers, we, have, we take notice. This is a really strong case that they're making. Think about it for a second. What does it mean to be necessary? To be necessary is that if Q, then P. That's how we would explain it logically. So showing up to class P is necessary in order to get an A in this class Q. Now think about it. Is it necessary, right? But that's different from sufficient. 
when I say P is sufficient for Q, it means if P then Q, but showing up to class P, is that sufficient in order to get an A in this class? That's when we should reconsider. Well, wait a minute. Is that the only thing I have to do? So that's the difference between necessary and sufficient. That necessary, it must be there. Sufficient, well, that's all you need. You don't need anything more than that. And when we say it's necessary and sufficient, P if and only if Q, this is something you'll see along uh, as well in a lot of math courses as well. That we say if and only if. What we're saying there is that it's both necessary and sufficient. You have to have it, and that's all you need. So when the hedonist argues that happiness is both necessary and sufficient, they're saying all you need in life is happiness, to achieve happiness, and you have to achieve happiness in order to live a good life. You can't live a good life, you can't call it good, if it's not a happy life. Doesn't matter what you think. If it's not a happy life, it's not a good life. Now there are more modern versions of, and modern in a relative sense. Uh, John Stuart Mill is an English philosopher, and he lived around the 1800s. And he's a hedonist as well, but he's not in the ancient Greek sense of the word hedonist. He kind of thinks that it needs an update. He needs to modify it for a more modern audience. And he notices that there might be actually a problem with old school hedonism, that that sort of ancient type of hedonism doesn't really address some aspects that we should think is are important when we talk about things in life and achieve happiness. So he develops this notion of the greatest happiness principle. And this is a principle, and a principle is something that you guide your life by. It's a rule or some sort of code that you say, this is the right way to live. This is the way I'm going to live. And he says that if happiness is the same thing as pleasure, well, not all pleasure is worth the same. What does he mean by that? That there's a quantitative difference versus a qualitative difference. That there are higher and lower levels. So it's not just about how much happiness you have in your life. You also need to consider what is the quality of happiness? What is, what, is it an instrumental, well, like I said, food or sex? What is the real value of, of the type of happiness that you're getting? And he says that if you gave the person the choice between a lower quality type of happiness versus a higher quality of happiness, that the person will more likely choose the higher. Why? Because objectively they know that that type of happiness is better. Now notice what he's saying. It's an objective truth that this type of happiness is better than another type of happiness. And that's really different than the way I think we talk about happiness today. When we talk about it as an emotional state, saying, well, that's very subjective. It's whatever I believe is happy makes me happy, whatever you know, type of happiness I want. But Neil is saying that, no, there's an objective, external sort of standard of happiness, something that's telling us that one is better than the other. How so? Well, he has this famous quote. He says, it is better to be a human being dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. Better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a fool satisfied. And if the fool or the pig are of a different opinion, it's because they only know their own side of the question. What does he mean by that? Let's think about it for a second. When he says it's better to be a human being dissatisfied than a pig satisfied, then there's a level of satisfaction, right, that we're talking about, saying, well, the pig is happy, the pig is satisfied, but somehow 
being a human who's not happy, who's not sad, that's better than being a pig. And it's better to be, well, what is satisfy, well, let's back up. What is satisfies a pig? Very basic, he's making the assumption very basic things. I think pigs are pretty intelligent, but he's making the assumption that pigs uh, are pretty satisfied with mud, food, pretty basic, right? And that, if you just give mud and food to a human being, Maybe it'll make some people happy or whatever, but that doesn't seem to be as good as maybe some higher levels of happiness that human beings enjoy. We, we can take appreciation to another level. And notice what he says next. Socrates decided in the fool satisfied. The fool is a fool, why? Because they lack knowledge. But Socrates, even though he professes that he doesn't have any knowledge, uh, he's going to say that he... Mill's going to say that Socrates, it's better to be Socrates. Socrates is never satisfied with any answer that he's provided. He's always asking questions. He's the classic uh, prototype philosopher. He's always going to ask questions about why. But in his questions, he gets better answers than the fool. The fool is just, well, whatever you tell me, I'll do. And notice what Mill is doing here again. If the fool or the pig are of a different opinion, it's because they only know their own side of the question. Now, this is a kicker. How is he going to show that one is better than the other? It's better to be a Socrates than a fool. It's better to be a human being than a pig. Because ask the fool or the pig. And if they say, well, it's not better to have this or that. Well, that's because they've never had this or that. They only know their own side. Uh, so the example that I try to create to kind of illustrate this is that let's imagine an individual farm. And let's say he's a college graduate and he has a rich relative and he inherits, let's say, $10,000, right? Great. What's he going to do with that $10,000? Well, he thinks about his options and says, well, I can give it, I can start a college tuition fund for my kid right, his newborn child, could start now, start saving up. Or I could put a down payment on a new car that he's been looking at. Hmm. Let's say he goes with giving the money to the college tuition fund rather than the new car. Why would he do that? Why would he, how would he know one is better than the other? Notice what it says in the description. He is a college graduate. He's had that experience. He sees the worth of a college education. If you ask a child, of course, right? The child doesn't know the difference. And that's what I think Mill is trying to say, is that who knows what is better in life? Ask the person who's had both experiences, who's had both levels, right? Don't ask the person who was only seeing one side, who has a very limited experience. They won't know what they're missing out on. And that's what he's saying about happiness, that maybe Socrates knows a, a higher level, more meaningful level to life what really matters in life. The fool is just satisfied with what they have in front of them and maybe that's it. But it's not so much about money and it's not so much about those kind of things. It's about going back to what I said about instrumental and intrinsic, what really matters in life. What are giving you the attitudinal pleasures? What, what giving you a deep sense of enjoyment rather than just a quick fix and so Mill is arguing objective happiness, the same. If you don't believe me, ask the person who's done both, who has both experiences, and ask them if they're willing to give up the greater for the lesser. And he thinks they won't. Once you explain something better, you don't want to go back. So he's saying our own personal experience reveals us to why happiness is in itself and not a subjective thing, but that it's actually 
an objective standard, something that we can measure and show one is better than the other. So if you're hedonist and you're convinced, well, obviously happiness is the way to go in life. That's what's going to bring me the whole point of life, to be happy. That's very flexible. That makes sense, right? Because everybody can go along with that. That makes sense in the sense that it doesn't tell you how to reach happiness. It doesn't give you instructions. And this is why I think maybe uh, is a lot different than modern types of happiness where I'll read this book and it tells me seven ways to be happy. It gives me instructions. There's no instructions to this. Everybody's life is different in that way. But they're telling you that the end goal is the same. And that allows you personal authority. That's actually a good thing that we see. It's like I get to decide how to live my life, how to achieve this goal, this objective goal of a good life, of being happy. And that it clearly improves my life. That if you're saying, well, how it sounds subjective to me, it's like, well, compare it to a life that's not happy, to a life that is. See, it seems to be a better. I don't think anybody wants to trade a life that's not a happy life with somebody else. And it provides a limit of explanation. This is important to philosophers. We want to find out what's the ground, what's the root of it all. What's the foundation? And happiness seems to be the foundation. Once you have happiness, you can't go any further. There's nothing you can do. There's no need to go further. Think about your own life. If you want to graduate, you're taking this class to graduate, and and what do you think you're going to do with that graduation, that that um, that diploma, right? Well, then you say, well, I'm going to get a job. I'm going to start my career. And what is the career going to do? Well, it's going to give me money to buy a house and start a family. It's like, okay, well, why would you want to do that? Well, ultimately, you want to live this happy life. And then let's say you achieve that. You, you live, you're living your, your best life, your happy life. Is there anything else you need? Do you need more money, more cars? Do you need another family? No, it seems to be that that's it. That, that seems to be the pit. There's nowhere else to go. There's no higher you can go. And it explains why the rules are not absolute. And that goes back to number one and two. That then you can see that if being a musician is your way to happiness, to be an artist is your way to happiness, that being an accountant is your way to happiness, then fine. It doesn't make any judgments on that level, just as long as you reach that. Now, this is where we get to chapter two. It's all good news until let's look at the cons as well. And you notice that's what Schaefer Lano does, does in a lot of the book. He gives you the pros to a theory, and then he shows you the alternative. What are the cons to the theory? It's not all perfect. So let's take this idea, this paradox of happiness, right? Say it's true that you want to achieve happiness. Happiness is the best thing, right? But notice what happens when you try too hard. And I think this is what he's showing in the paradox of hedonism. If happiness is the only thing that directly makes us better off, then it makes sense that that's how I should spend my day. I should be doing my, all, everything that I do throughout the day is to be happy. This is all going for my happy goal. But it doesn't make sense to do that. Because if you notice the person who spends all their time trying to be happy and all their effort to be happy, are they happy? No, they tend to be actually more miserable. And so, if that's the case, then something else matters than just happiness. If I can say it's not all good, then it doesn't go with what the heathens are saying, that all good means happiness. That's the only thing that's really that good, is happiness. They say, well, no, I don't, happiness is not going to give me really the best life. 
Now it could be, that doesn't mean that it's not necessary. The here is saying it's not sufficient, that you're going to need more in it than just happiness to live your life. But she from Landau admits that happiness can be a necessary component. We, happiness is part of being, having a good life. But it seems to be working as more of a side effect than a goal. Notice the musician who practices again and again. Uh, easy example are guitar players, right? Uh, my uncle's a guitar player. And, you know, you build calluses and you have to practice every day. Your fingers hurt and it's not a really pleasurable experience, right? And you notice a lot of people try to pick up an instrument or guitarist and say, yeah, I'm gonna, it's going to be awesome. And they have all these dreams about being an awesome musician. And then it's like, oh, I'm going to have to practice every day? I'm going to have to like hurt my fingers and wear them down to the point where I have calluses and I, oh, I don't want to do that. And then they quit for two weeks of guitar lessons or whatever, right? But for the musician who's serious about this, they're not doing it for the happiness because, you know, it's actually a lot of work. And most of the time it, it doesn't work out. Most of the time you don't get the notes right and you keep practicing, you know? But occasionally, maybe, when they get it right, things go well, they do some, feel a sense of that accomplishment, that happiness, right? But it's more acting like a side effect. That's not the principal goal of the whole thing. It just seems to be uh, something that's like a pleasant add-on. But is that enough to destroy? And like, let's throw away hedonism. And life is not about happiness. No, not yet. The problem, though, is a much more insidious problem. And this is where you get to the evil pleasures. What if, when they say happiness is a good life, makes a good life, what if what makes, helps me accomplish happiness, happiness for me, is taking it out on others? What do I do there? How can that be good to treat other people badly if it makes me happy, basically? So if hedonism is true, let's take two situations. Let's take two different situations and they have equal amounts of happiness and unhappiness. Well, then one is not going to be better than the other. If they're the same amount of happiness on either side of the situation that one can't say one is better than the other. But let's say one situation, happiness is brought about by torturing other. And this is why I have the character, famous character from Game of Thrones, Joffrey. He, if you've watched the show or you're familiar with the books, he is a character who takes pleasure in other people's pain. And if the hedonist is right that pleasure is a good life. It's not saying that you can't cause pain to get your pleasure. And that seems wrong to us, or it should seem wrong to us. It's like, wait a minute, that doesn't seem like a good life. What about if somebody gets pleasure by helping others? Doesn't seem to be a better life? And if we do agree that it's better, then why? It has to be more than just happiness because the happiness is on the same level it's equal but if one is better than the other then we have to be measuring it by something else and it can't be based on false happiness and this is a situation that i think is really interesting that the heathenness didn't precisely clarify that the happiness that you're achieving is the happiness that comes with telling the truth just said happiness. It didn't say that you have to have the truth. But if that's the case, then something based on lies that makes people happy is just as good as something that's based on the truth. And this is where they get the example of the unfaithful husband. And I'll just generalize it to unfaithful spouse or, or partner, right? Is that if you believe that happiness is the only thing that really matters, then what if you're presented with a situation 
where you'll, let's say two scenarios. One, your partner is cheating on you, but you never find out. And you go to your deathbed and you're happy. Believe that this is a perfect relationship and everything is great. Or the alternative. The partner is still cheating on you, but you do find out. So you, what do you get the response? You get the truth. Find out the truth. But notice what you might sacrifice in the process. You might sacrifice the happiness by learning the devastating truth. Now, I've had students in previous uh, classes tell me, well, yeah, but you'll be happier in the end. It's a better life in the end to know the truth. And, and you'll find real happiness down the line. We'll notice it's not a guarantee. I mean, we like to think so. It feels good to think about that, but there's no guarantee that you will. Some people never find another person. It's too crushing for them. Uh, they they never remarry or or find a partner that'll fulfill that anymore. And this is where we get to Robert Nozick. Robert Nozick is a very famous contemporary 20th century philosopher much modern philosopher and he has this great book called uh anarchy state and utopia which is part of the readings and in it we're reading a small excerpt of what he's calling the experience machine what is the experience machine the experience machine is something along the lines as you see in a lot of pop culture like the matrix or uh inception things like that what if we can control your experiences? What if we can put you in a machine and you can experience anything you want to experience? Anything that'll make you happy. And Nozick is proposing this. Now he's really a political philosopher, but he's proposing, and this is part of his political philosophy. If it's all about happiness, right? Maybe that's what a government is supposed to be about, utopia, like providing happiness. If it's truly about that, then what if the government could provide you this machine and you just plug yourself in so you live any life it's all pre-programmed so then you can imagine you're a rock star you're a famous scientist whatever you want there's no limits would you plug yourself in Now he gives some scenarios, right? He says, well, maybe the first couple of years, you plug yourself in three or five years and then you come out of it. You don't remember anything when you're inside the machine. So you think it's all real. You don't know that it's this is virtual system, but that you think it's a really real thing that everything you experience is completely real. But it's only when you come out of it, you realize, oh, it was just uh, the machine. Would you be okay with that? Would you dedicate three or five years of your life in those type of scenarios? And they say, yeah, seems right. Well, then that seems what hedonism is saying, that happiness, you were happy in the machine, so what's the problem? But if you have some sort of reservation, say, oh, wait a minute, I don't wanna sit there in a chair or in a tub or something, connect to a bunch of cords that can call that a life, well, then that's telling you something is up with this sort of claim that happiness is all there is. Now, I think most of us might be curious about doing it for a year, a couple of months or something. It sounds pretty good. They take care of our bodies. We don't have to worry about them. And we get to live this awesome life. But would you plug yourself in permanently? Would you just check out and say, this is my new life? Think about it for a moment. If you're going to say no, then that's kind of Nozick's point. Nozick is pointing out that if Neil and the other humans are really right, everybody should just be willing to plug themselves in. But if we're kind of hesitant, wait a minute, I don't want that life. Why? Because we're not doing something. I'm imagining, or like I'm connected there. I believe I'm doing something, but I'm not really doing anything. 
I'm not really that rock star. I'm not really that person. And it's not reality. And if you think those things are important, then hedonism is not the philosophy for you. Hedonism is not, it, life is more than just about happiness. And notice, what do you lose in response? What you lose in response, this is kind of his Nozick position against somebody like Mill, is that you're losing what really makes a good life good. Well, what is that? Well, we can't just be happiness. Now, those exact saying happiness is not important, but not the only thing. Autonomy is important as well. Why? Because autonomy means that you are in control of your life. You make your decisions. In the machine scenario, you thought you're making your own decisions, but it's all pre-programmed. It's all pretty written. You don't have real free will. You don't have autonomy. But sometimes we say, well, sometimes you have to give up your free will to be happy. And that is a type of pro, uh, paternalism. So paternalism here is this idea that, notice the word, kind of, it's really like the parent, right? That you're, when you treat an individual as a child when they're actually an adult who can make their own decisions, but you treat them as a child, you make decisions for them, what you're doing essentially is taking away their autonomy, their free will. And I think most of us are not okay with that. Right? Even if it does offer us happiness, maybe they know what's best for us. It's like, are we willing to give up our free will in the process? If you're not, then you're telling me autonomy is more important in this situation than happiness that you rather have free will than just be happy. Now, when you look at the exchange, autonomy doesn't always give you happiness, though. You may make the wrong decision, but it's your decision. So you're willing to give up the possibility of happiness sometimes in order to have that ability to make your own decisions. Now, there's also the element of trajectory as well. Like we say well you could what about if you started off unhappy and then you ended up happy for a lot of us that seems actually better than imagine if you started off happy and then ended up miserable we would have a problem with that i think but for the hedonists if we take their arguments as well happiness in the beginning versus happiness at the end doesn't matter if it evens out but for us, I think a lot of us would say, well, wait a minute, no, it doesn't even out for us. It doesn't really seem that better. It seems actually, in this sense, that a trajectory of upward, right? We, we start off kind of struggling, but if we end up successful, it feels better, it seems better. Then it has to be something else than just happiness. And that things that cause us unhappiness are not the only things that can harm us. That is an important point to make as well. That things that can harm us don't are not always just in terms of happiness or unhappiness. Some things that can harm us, we might feel good about. And I think this is where we'll stop our recording because we're gonna to get to the dress, and what about a theory instead that's arguing for subjective goals instead of an objective goal?